I always say that we have the most beautiful beaches in the world. We have um, beautiful landscapes just outside Swansea, but you can't afford to go. You can't afford to take your family to see them. A um, um, lot of people were uh, locked in during the lockdown. That's the life we spent la for the last four years. The Asylum Seeker um, uh, claims system is, is just a complete mess. Um, there, there are far too many bad decisions, decisions made hastily. It's like, it's like a lottery. Everybody says it's a lottery, but it's a lottery in which you stand to lose an awful lot. They said, you're going to have to go. It's not your choice. You can't choose where you're going to go and start. They're quite strict, you know, like when you're an Asylum Seeker, you feel like you don't have the power. And especially like these days, you feel like whoever has the power can do whatever they want. Then, but then being a asylum seeker, you feel you're under pressure, and you're gonna have to go what they've chosen to do. So it's like them choosing your life and where you're gonna live, where you're gonna end up. You can be working with someone, and then suddenly you realise they're not been in for a week, and you actually never see them again, or never hear from them again. Human being needs the same dignity, whether it is one person or one million people. Without that, that human being ceases to be a human being. Months, years waiting for decisions, being called liars, being made destitute if they fail, um, all sorts of terrible things. Plus, of course, people's attitude towards them, which is one of the things we really exist to improve on. And from the point of view of City of Sanctuary, um, I think the big issue is that most people don't know much about asylum seekers and haven't met them and not particularly even aware of anything apart from what they see in the newspapers. In the 70s in Chile, which is a country in South America, at the time, and still now, classed as an underdeveloped country, still with massive differences between the very, very rich and the very, very poor. Within that context, the country of Chile, my home country, in the 70s, decided in a democratically way to elect a totally different government to the ones that had been in the whole history of the country. And that different government was a socialist government led by Dr. Salvador Allende. 10th of September 1973, we were celebrating that step forward and that dream that there was going to be a new way of life. However, on the dawn of the 11th of September, the 9-11-73, 9-11, the other 9-11, we went to bed very late because of this party of celebration. Very early in the morning, we heard, <laughs> compañeros, compañeros, comrades, military coup, military coup, please run away, otherwise they're going to kill you.
basically my parents are originally Kurdish Iraqi, but then when they used to live in Iraq, they had problems and stuff with the language, being Kurdish, you can't speak Kurdish and stuff. So they decided the best thing to do is just to travel through a boat to another country. So when they went into the boat, the boat broke by Cyprus. So they had to live in Cyprus, the British area, for 20 years. And then after 20 years, after we finally got the passports and stuff that we fought for, we've decided to uh, flew uh, to come with the airplane to the UK. Yeah, uh, I came uh, in this country. In back home, I was working in uh, Sydney. Sydney is uh, a commission, electoral independent national and uh, they organize election in back home. And uh, you know the system of Africa, now the problem we have, the president, they like to stay more and more time in the power, long time. And for me, the population didn't like him. And uh, the president stayed for 20 years in the power and they like just to organize election. Policeman, cannot vote in constitution. And from them, they like us to give also the, the police sorry, and uh, military voting cards to vote from their advantage when the vote will come in. The objective he was to kill me. And uh, someone, he helped me, the friend of my father. And uh, that one I came, I left my country, I came here. That is the issue, the problem I had in Bakom. When I was in Pakistan, um, the life was very, very upsetting because of the family's issue. I was not able to go to school all the time and I was, I was in like dark all the time just thinking that, you know, if I were to go out of the house, people will kill me because, you know, I've been threatened from my family members that if you go, if you go out, if you, if you do anything, we will just kill you. My desire to stay here and seek asylum really was to protect myself and the children. when you, you are going through the journey with the domestic violence and trying to find a way to sort yourself out, I found that very hard because at that time, I was no recourse to public funds. So it was difficult to, to find somebody who would take me in as somebody who is no recourse to public funds. And it wasn't clear what someone who is not because public funds can also access so what side of support. And in that particular moment, I found it was hard. I had to follow my husband who was, um, who was, um, escaping from threats back home so um, I had to leave everything behind and the job that I loved and which I thought for the uh, job for the life uh, so I had to leave everyone behind um, as well as everything I love. At the end of the last century, the, uh, the government announced that they would start dispersing asylum seekers. There was a lot of hysteria about as asylum seekers at the time. And uh, so this new policy was adopted to, to, um, to send asylum seekers out all over the country, all over England, Scotland and Wales. And um, Swansea came up on the list of, uh, of places. Uh, I was, I was uh, I don't, I'm not from Swansea, but I was, uh, I was living in Swansea then. And um, there was a lot of concern in Swansea, a bit of hysteria as well about how, you know, who, who are all these people who are going to be coming from foreign countries and, 
Um, people felt a bit, some people felt very threatened. And so a, a support group was, was started. Um, the meeting was actually attacked by some far-right hooligans. And uh, it wasn't a major incident, they, you know. But um, the upshot of that was that this organization was founded, which is now Swansea Asylum Seekers Support, um, to try and coordinate local support for asylum seekers. And I've been involved in that ever since. City of Sanctuary is uh, basically just an idea rather than an organization. It's about making the city uh, welcoming, so that the idea is for people who are new here, whether they're asylum seekers or any other kind of newcomer, they can go anywhere in the city and people will be friendly towards them, welcoming, they'll try to involve them in everything they're doing. The biggest thing which people don't know about asylum seekers and refugees is that they are ordinary people. They're just as likely to be keen on photography or rock climbing or to be have got a PhD in some subject as anybody else. I think uh, the thing that most asylum seekers say to me about what they like about working here is that they can just be themselves when they're here. They're not like a, an asylum seeker. <laughs> they're just whoever they are and they're just somebody who can be really helpful to Oxfam and in the same way that anybody else can be helpful to Oxfam and I think uh, so I think there's lots of reasons why people get a lot out of it. I think uh, another thing that uh, people get out of working here is that they it can be when you arrive in a new city it can you can feel very isolated and so it's a really good way of getting out and making friends and getting new connections. Um, and I think everything that I'm saying about asylum seekers is actually the same as for all our volunteers, which I think is a really important point to make. So asylum seekers get uh, life experience, work experience, friends, um, unity, um, get to meet people, but then that's just the same for everybody else as well. So I might have, um, you know, we, we might have an asylum seeker who's lonely, but there are also lots of people who've lived in Swansea all their lives who are lonely as well. Uh, with the experience I have, first of all, as a, as a woman having gone through domestic violence, uh, having gone through the asylum process, uh, and having raised children, in this country, I, I feel I have that experience that I can use to, to support other people. And that's what a lot of what I'm finding now in this job, that a lot of people I meet are going through the, exactly the same, po uh, the same sin scenarios that I went through. So I, I'm able to put myself in their shoes and actually remove the emotion out of it and forge for forward for them. As we speak now on a Friday night, I can think of the Swansea Bay Asylum Seeker Support Group, the drop-in in centre. If you could just transport your minds, you will go there at St James's Church in the Uplands and you will find about 100 and 200 people of all ages, men, women, kids, from all nationalities, asylum seekers and refugees, having a cup of tea, having some food, having a space for them to talk, to share their uncertainty about the future, to talk about what happened in the past, and then a group of 10, 15 volunteers, most of them local people, who are there just to help. And I need to mention, in that organization, there is somebody who had been doing this for at least 25 years without a rest of one month or one day, and always done it on a totally voluntary basis, in the most generous, compassionate way, and that I think it is the best people that any city can have. So Swansea City of Sanctuary, I think I can, I can say it, it, it kind of emerged out of um, our drop-in and, and what we were doing and, and people, people coming to the community, uh, to our drop-ins and, and, and talking about what to do next, what new things to do. And I think it's been a brilliant initiative because, um, well, speaking on behalf of, of SAS, what we do, we're just kind of 
got our heads down busy week on week, keeping the whole thing running, keeping it going. And uh, um, to have an organization that takes a more kind of strategic role that, that, that works with, that um, organizes lots and lots of partnerships with lots of mainstream organizations. Um, so over the years, uh, the City of Sanctuary has done some marvelous work. All sorts of organizations have signed up to the City of Sanctuary pledge. So faith groups, businesses, um, public services, local authority is a, is a major, major one. Um, community groups, uh, sports groups, and any group of people, children's groups, play groups, schools, very important. I would say the biggest success has been that the idea that Swansea is a city of sanctuary has kind of become embedded. So if the, if the mayor or the leader of the council or any of the local MPs is making a speech, I mean, it, as long as the topic is at all relevant, they're very likely to say, I'm proud that Swansea is a city of sanctuary. And that means that if you're employed by the council or if you're in any, any role in Swansea, you know that um, it's, you know, it's, your, it's your own impulse to be friendly towards newcomers, but you know that it's the right thing to do and that it, that it isn't, you shouldn't be going along with um, any of the hate speech you might hear elsewhere. Another important thing is that because asylum seekers are just ordinary people, they all want to be active mm. and they have a lot of time to spend waiting for a decision and they really are mostly looking for opportunities. They would like to have opportunities for meeting people, learning English, to volunteer. Um, you will find asylum seekers volunteering with all kinds of organisations and you may be an organisation that uses volunteers. Perhaps you haven't thought of the fact that asylum seekers could be not somebody you help, but somebody who volunteers for you. Absolutely. In some cases, they do both in the same organisation. People were there and they said that, you know, we can help you. We will be we will be supporting you. So they helped me to go to college. They helped me to, you know, start volunteering with communities. So that's how I improved my language. I improved everything the communication with people, the understanding and talking, you know, talking with a different organisation. That helps me a lot. The support which I had from in Swansea, it was like, you know, phenomenal because all the communities were very helpful. All the people I met in Swansea, the organisation and the communities, they support us all the time. The City of Century, East, Red Cross, and you are Unity Diversity and Fusion and Waterfront Museum and Women's Group. They all were standing with me with each challenges which I passed and I go through with the different, uh, the different you know, problems, but they were always there to help me. And I am very proud that I am part of this Swansea organization. And I mean, I'm part of this Swansea community where people are where people people are there for me, and they are always helpful and supported me with each problems. Uh, mentally, it helped me quite a lot because if I wasn't volunteering, I can't go out. I can't afford to go out in Swansea. As you know, the bus fare cost is extremely high. You cannot go out as a family at all so I thought I mean kids would be going to school anyway so they would find company in their, within their friends however uh, we would be so isolated if, I, if we didn't go out but when I came to Swansea something was different it's, I don't know whether because now I had a bit of experience or is because of because uh, there are more there was there were more activities or more services than I had seen before. So being able to work with the African Community Center, then my world of network opened. So I was able to meet other, you know, other, other women organizations like those days. I don't know if you remember, Mune was very good, you know, and, uh, and women resource. And so Swansea felt a bit different. All the time I work in, all the time he asked me about my case, my life, the things like that. And he knew very well my case like my lawyer. 
And he knows if I will not come in, in Ox Farm, I will tell him. And the people know me everywhere in the different community. If I'm absent, maybe something is happen. You know, it's, it's upsetting and it's distressing to think that our friend's been picked up in the middle of the night and taken to a detention centre. But because of the support network that we've got, um, not just in Oxfam, but through City of Sanctuary and um, asylum seeker drop-ins and different organisations, if we know somebody's been taken to detention, then we can sort of all get working on that and uh, help each other to help out the person who's there. Even to my friend, uh, some family, they ask me, you are not speaking good English. You came just last year. How do people support you? How did you make this connection with people? How did you know people? And you are black, there it's white, you come in this country, they accept you. Even in my camp, some friend I have, they stay in Cardiff. They say, Cardiff is not like that. Why? It's, Swansea is not, they found just this boring place. It's, it's not a good place, but how you found people you met? I say, just come Swansea, you will know. It's difficult to explain. It's, it's like magic. You know, the community is very, very important. The next day um, we were in the shop. Again, it was a shift that Otis would have been on. Um, and Alice was uh, working on that shift. He knows Otis well and is also a fantastic anti-racist activist and organiser <laughs> and uh, uh, is very good at organising rallies <laughs> and had one organised by the end of the day. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, fr from that, um, we were able to build a really strong campaign. The way Oxfam work anywhere in the world is that we go into places and we talk to the local communities and we work with the local communities. And I think, although we're a shop, we should still reflect Oxfam's values in that way. So I think it's great that we're able to work with people like City of Sanctuary and the Asylum Seeker Support Group and the various drop-ins around Swansea to build that kind of network of people who want to help and support refugees. Um, it, it's really important for us as, a, as Oxfam to do that kind of sharing and working together. It's also from a purely cynical point of view, it's been really good for the shop because for example, anytime we're low on volunteers, we just go along to the drop-in, get chatting to people. And by the end of the night, we've got more people volunteering. So, um, you know, it, it works both ways and yeah, we, we support each other, hopefully. It's a movement of refugees and asylum seekers with their supporters. It's not about you know, us doing things for them. I, I need, you know, like, like most people, you need to have something else that you do. So it was either, you know, very, very self-destructive drinking or stamp collecting or... <laughs> but no, I decided to support refugees. No, it's, it's, um, it's, I get a lot of emotional and intellectual and spiritual even fulfilment out of it. Um, I've met tons and tons of really interesting people, and um, I feel I've, I've, I've made a bit of, bit of a difference, which is, you know, feels good. Swansea is a good host city, and people are very good at heart, because all the people I work with, my colleagues at SCVS, all very good, very accommodating, and very friendly, and even in the community. My, my friends who are <coughs> from Swansea, very, very good friends. So if people can keep this smiling attitude, <laughs> it's good. And it makes people feel at ease. Even when uh, people come with big problems, or sometimes all you need is a smiling face. The main positive things that I've seen here is the people, and they are always by you to help you. I never thought that I'm going to find this help and stuff, you know, like, for because I used to live in London and it's quite busy and not many people they there's support but then you feel 
they, they're not free to get me. They're quite busy, they've got their jobs and stuff. But then when we moved here, and when I saw the people, they, they were the ones that told me, oh, there's this organization that helped, there's this place to go and stuff. So if they weren't, they weren't here, I, could, I don't think I'm gonna be here today. I wouldn't even be a worship parliament member because I wouldn't have anyone call me, oh, Sandy, you have to apply to it. I wouldn't have people that are pushing me, oh, go and do this, go and do this and stuff. So I feel like people are the main positive things that are with you and helping you to improve and stuff. So yeah. Briefly, I love Sonsi. Um, I think it will be our final destination. We don't have to move away from the city. Sonsi is beautiful because, not because of its um, natural beauty, not because we have finest beaches in the country or beautiful um, outdoors. It's beautiful because of its people. I, I found really kind, lovely people uh, in Swansea and in Wales, all Wales. Well, over the next 10 years, um, remembering that City of Sanctuary is a national movement, we would hope that we have a chance to start changing policy at a national level because the nature of City of Sanctuary is that um, within each town and city, right across the country, um, many more people are being involved and, and become supporters. So we hope that that eventually will, will have an, an effect on the political situation, which is the biggest. If we make that contribution, we'll be really, really pleased because that's so important for people. You know, there's, there's people who will tell you the story about you know, the first day that they arrived, they, they, they get bussed here, and then they get put in a, in a mini bus and taken to Blind Mice or somewhere like that, a little house. And then the next morning, they walk out of the house, they haven't a clue where they are. And uh, this old guy, um, Mohammed, who's, uh, who's still with us, he, uh, he, he likes telling this story. He walks from where it was Penland, down into the centre of town, down to the sea. And then he, he didn't have his address to get back home and he, didn't, he had no idea at all where he was. He spoke no English at that stage whatsoever. And somebody helped him. Some random passerby saw him and he managed to communicate just enough and he, somehow or other they got him back to his house. But you know, people really, people really seem to care. That's a kind of typical Swansea story. I have to describe Swansea. I know a visitor would say beautiful Gawa Peninsula, which is this beautiful. I would like to say first, beautiful people with a big heart, people with decency, people with human compassion. I love the Gawa Peninsula. I like Three Cliff, I like the sea. But the sea and the Gawa Peninsula and the beaches by themselves couldn't bring the spirit of humanity that we all need. Of course, we are double lucky because we've got a beautiful city in terms of its environment. But I think that more important than that, we have wonderful, human, compassionate people, decent people who make Swansea special. And I like to think I'm not the only person who says that. Look, the people he did for me, I didn't give them anything, but just to help you from what? Today I got it. What's their advantage? Nothing. What they benefit? Nothing. What they gave something, they ask me money, no. They take some benefit for me, nothing. But they just wanted you to be safe.